Welcome to another episode of the Mapscaping Podcast. My name is Daniel and this is a podcast for the geospatial community. My guest on the show today is Ben Clark. He is a software engineer on a product called Rapid, the Rapid Editor. Now, so this is a free and open source product produced by Meta, the, the company formerly known as Facebook. And the whole idea of this product, the software tool, is to help people conflate AI and authoritative data sets with OpenStreetMap data. So the idea of Rapid is to help you map faster. So in this episode, you also learn what ESRI, the humanitarian OpenStreetMap team, and a company called Mapillary have to do with this. But I'll let Ben explain a lot more about that in just a second. As usual, there'll be a bunch of interesting and hopefully relevant links in the show notes for you today. So if you're looking for more information on any of the topics covered during this conversation, that would be a great place to start. Hey Ben, welcome to the podcast. You are a software engineer at Meta in the Maps Geo team. And today we're going to be talking about something called Rapid. And I think before we we get into all this great stuff, maybe you could just introduce yourself. Who are you? How did you get involved with with geospatial? How did you end up in in Meta's Maps Geo team? Hi, I'm Ben Clark. I'm a web developer here at Meta. And uh, I guess you could say I kind of came by geospatial a bit dishonestly. I joined the group without fully realizing what it was that they they did here in geospatial, which was really a lot of awesome work done, especially in the open source community. And so I got a chance after I joined the team to start working on this tool called Rapid and have been working on it pretty much ever since for the last almost four years now. But first of all, I got to say, so we've had a lot of accidental geographers on the podcast before. You are the very first dishonest geographer that showed up. <laughs> what, what were you doing before? Were you somewhere else in Meta? Were you a, a another company, what were you doing? And what was that transition from whatever it was you were doing before like coming into the, the Maps Geo team? The transition was easy because the team is great. But uh, in a previous life, uh, most of my software career has been spent working at like cloud, network storage, middleware kinds of places where I didn't have a lot of chance to work directly with an open source community and to work directly with front end tech. And I found that I really loved doing both of those. So Rapid has just been an absolutely wonderful job. And I hope to keep at this for as long as I can. Okay, so 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 far in the conversation, we know that there's something called Rapid. We know it's a front end something, something, and we know it's open source. Maybe you could put a few more words around that for us. What, what is Rapid? So Rapid is a free, easy to use, web-based, open source map editor for OpenStreetMap. So any one of your Listeners, if they're familiar with OpenStreetMap and they want to edit it, they can just point any browser to rapideditor.org and then click the Start Mapping button, and it will pop up in your browser, and you are off to the races. Okay, so when I search for this, so I find something called Map with AI. This is also the Rapid Editor that we're talking about. That is correct. So Map with AI is a soon-to-be-retired domain name that we used to use when we first launched Rapid. And so Rapid has been through a few releases since Map with AI's launch. And so we're retiring that name because we feel that Rapid at this point is a lot more than just mapping with AI. I think that's really important for the, for the listeners to understand. And just in case they, they land on that, that website and, and get a little bit confused. And perhaps we could stay with this notion of, of mapping with AI just for a second. What, what do you mean when you say map with AI? By mapping with AI, we don't mean that the tools themselves are using AI. We're talking about AI-generated data. And in this case, these are road and building shapes that were generated from orthographic satellite imagery. So, you know, neural nets, deep learning, trained to identify map shapes by evaluating that imagery. Okay, and and who created those, those data sets? So Meta created a global roads data set, and Microsoft created a buildings data set that is available in most countries. Well, why start with those two data sets? Like, what, what was the idea here? Because my, my, my guess is people could get those data into OpenStreetMap other ways as well, or, or could they? So I'll start with a little bit of an anecdote, which was my very first exposure to the OpenStreetMap community. I had been at Meta for about a week when I was sent to Washington, D.C. to participate in a youth mappers mapathon. And one of the tasks set before the mappers was to add buildings in one section of the planet. And several people from the audience, once they heard that I was working with Meta 
on the software, they came up to me and said, hey, is there, is there any way you can make you know, adding buildings and roads easier? Uh, and they wanted the ability to just have sort of a one-click addition workflow because the state of the art at the time was to look at satellite imagery and then sort of painstakingly trace the road and building shapes on top of it, which can be a bit time consuming. And so I think that is really the jumpstart to why Meta and Microsoft were looking at using AI to predict and generate these data, to generate these map shapes, because they are sort of more easily discernible from orthographic satellite imagery than other types of data. And we already have really great global imagery sets to sort of run training and ML over. So if I'm understanding this correctly, the, the idea here is we are conflating AI data of these, uh, these building layers and road layers with OSM data in this kind of human in, in the loop uh, process. Why not just take this data and, you know, where we're missing data in OpenStreetMap, just, just dump it in there? Ah, yes. Yeah. So you said a phrase that's near and dear to our heart, uh, and that is human in the loop. We want to make absolutely sure that no data gets into the map that isn't really high accuracy, that isn't of good quality. And for sure, we have data in both of these data sets that are incorrect. We may have predicted a road where there is actually a stream bed, or we may have predicted a building that is actually just a parking lot. And so we want to make sure that humans have the chance to review each and every one of these shapes that gets added to OpenStreetMap. So that makes a, a lot of sense to me. I mean, this, this extra layer of security, I mean, it sounds like a brilliant idea. Is there also some recognition that this is a community-based map here and perhaps you'd be standing on people's toes if you just started, in my words, not yours, dumping AI-generated data sets into the map? Yes, I think that when we first launched uh, back in 2019, we were very aware that these sorts of AI changes might be a bit controversial. And that's one of the reasons why we spent so much time making sure that it wasn't possible to just add these things directly, that we are trying to encourage our editors using Rapid to think about each shape that they're adding and to not just sort of blindly click as fast as they can. That's not the sort of reason why we want to include humans in the loop. We want to make sure that people are engaging honestly with the data. Since then, we have had a couple of instances, I believe that there was a community survey done for OpenStreetMap asking if these sorts of AI-derived change sets should be allowed. And I believe that the community sort of overwhelmingly voted that, yes, this is just another tool that we can use and that the folks who don't want to use this data don't have to feel forced to use it. They can still map in the way that they have always mapped. Thank you very much for, for that explanation. I appreciate a little bit more context there. Uh, maybe it'd be really helpful for the listeners if you explain what the process looks like. So let's say I, I open up the rapid editor in my browser, I click on a layer, a buildings layer, and I see buildings in the, the area that, that I am ready to map. What, what do I do to add that building to OSM? What does the process look like? Picture in your mind's eye, you're looking at some satellite imagery, sort of top down what they call orthographic sat imagery, like you would see in any navigation app. So in this imagery, you might see a road or a building, and then you would also see some of the OpenStreetMap data that may already be inside that bit of imagery. So maybe some of the buildings already have parallelograms sketched around their borders, but maybe some of the buildings are missing. And if you're using Rapid and you're in the right section of the planet where we do have these predictions, then you will see a series of shapes of a certain color that appear over those buildings and you can just sort of hover your mouse and click on them and then just hit a single button to convert them from a perspective feature one that's ready to add to the map and just add it straight to the map so you can do this repeatedly and then when you're happy with your changes you click save and those features are now part of the open street map database wow it's kind of amazing it reminds me of those uh, captures that you have to solve to sort of prove that you're a human Yes, it's kind of like that, except the, with the CAPTCHAs, we don't really have a good notion of whether a building is actually right or wrong. We've done some QA on these data to make sure that the sort of poor predictions don't make it to the user so that they're not looking at, at bad predictions. 
But the ones that we're reasonably confident in, uh, we're hoping that the users sort of provide that last bit of quality assurance. So unlike a CAPTCHA, we don't know the answer beforehand. We're not testing you. We're genuinely trying to encourage people to put this data in front of them and say, hey, if you think it's worth it to put this into the map, go for it. If there's already a, a registered polygon on this building that I can see, somebody else has traced around it, and, and I can see that the, the AI-generated data set is more accurate, what, what, what do I do? Ah, so that's a really good question, and we do not have a very clean answer for this. So if you were to imagine you're looking at a bunch of buildings on the map, and let's say that they're all just sort of simple rectangles, parallelograms, right? So four points per building. Now, a lot of buildings actually could really use sort of a more fine-grained treatment. They might have many more faces than just four, four walls. And so a lot of the authoritative data that we use in Rapid, uh, and we can cover that in a bit, that there's a whole other API integration from Esri with some really good building shapes. If we have a better building in Rapid, unfortunately, we won't show it to you. We only try to show places where there are data gaps. But right now, we do not show places where we think, hey, there's already a building here in OSM, but we think we have a better one. And here's what that looks like. That is an experience we'd like to build. Yeah, that, that, that's interesting. Um, I, I can understand why you would focus on, on the gaps first, though. Let's talk about authoritative data, because I, th I think this is really, really interesting. First of all, let me, let me ask, ask a question. Can AI be authoritative? Oh, that's a very good question. I think that at this point, people think of authoritative, and when I say people, I say also myself, authoritative data, and this is something actually covered by the geographer of the US in his opening remarks at State of the Map US recently. He didn't really love the term authoritative data because he felt that it could you know, potentially muddy the waters. He just wanted to make the point that I don't care if your data is authoritative, I just care if it's accurate. I don't care who commissioned its creation, I just care that it's accurate. So I think most of your listeners, I would say, I wouldn't consider AI data to be authoritative, precisely because we're trying to ask them to make that decision on a case-by-case -case basis. Like, is this good enough to include in the map? So that's a very tough question to answer, though. I, I think you did a brilliant job. I think it's Maybe um, it doesn't matter where it came from, but once a human has looked at it and says, yes, this is correct. Yes, th this is a great answer. And I think then maybe it becomes authoritative. Yep. Yeah, I, I, I think that's, that's a really good way to put it. So I know that you said earlier that you're moving away from this idea of mapping with AI. And again, AI meaning the, these AI generated data sets. And now you're talking about authoritative data sets. And we've talked a little bit about what, what that might mean. How is authoritative data getting into Rapid and therefore into OSM? Can, can you explain that, that process to us, please? Sure. So users of Rapid, when they click on a, a, the Rapid button in the top of the window, they have the ability to open up an ArcGIS dataset browser. And this is an ArcGIS-hosted OpenStreetMap community API. So these are all datasets that have been looked at by Esri's QA folks. It has been licensed by their internal editors to make sure that this data is ready to be ingested into OpenStreetMap. So what they do is they work with either NGOs, local governments, things like a county seat or a town hall for a particular township, and they will take addresses and building shapes right now and put them into this data integration. And then you can add them to the Rapid editor the same way that you can already consume the Meta and Microsoft roads and buildings. So the advantage to these is that, as you said, they are authoritative. They are very high quality, very well mapped, uh, very high accuracy data sets. Their only disadvantage is that they are pretty hyper local, you know, a single zip code or a single county at a time, as opposed to being global like the AI data sets can be. And, and is the process to adding them or conflating them with OSM data, is, is it the same? The process of conflating them is largely the same, yes. We actually have part of our secret sauce in Rapid is that it's not all in the client, it's not all in the browser. We have a backend service that is sort of doing some of this conflation work behind the scenes. So when you're looking at a particular tile of map data, behind the scenes, this service is fetching data from Esri's API, fetching OSM data from the OSM database, 
and then running a conflation algorithm so that you're only seeing the buildings that are missing from the OSM data. How does uh, Mapillary play into this? Ah, so Mapillary is, you can consider them sort of one of our sister organizations here in Maps Geo. So for folks who are unfamiliar, they're a crowdsourced street view imagery company. And we do actually have an integration inside of Rapid and have for many years for viewing mapillary imagery. But pretty soon this year, we hope to roll out a new feature whereby people can use mapillary predictions. That is to say, predicted objects such as fire hydrants, utility poles, bike parking, and other types of infrastructure. Things that would be almost impossible to detect from orthographic satellite imagery, which is generally taken you know, from space. It's very hard to look at that stuff and say, oh yeah, that's bike parking. The imagery is just not high enough resolution to do that. So street view imagery is sort of a, a next level way for us to be able to think of good data sets, good data to add to OpenStreetMap. So we've been talking about the, you, you mentioned this idea of street view imagery. Um, I think people, a lot of people listening to this will be familiar with that from Google Maps. I, I realize now perhaps we jumped in a little bit too deep. Maybe we should start <laughs> like, what is Mapillary first? But could you, could you give us a sort of brief summary of Mapillary, what it is, how it works, that kind of thing? Sure. Mapillary is a street view imagery sort of crowdsourcing. So you can sign up for a Mapillary account, get a camera either your cell phone, or you can get a little bit more fancy and buy like a 360 degree image camera and mount it to your car. And then you can just drive around your neighborhood wherever you're interested in capturing images. And when you're done capturing, you upload the images to Mapillary and pretty soon you will see those images on the Mapillary website. But another cool thing that happens after the fact is that Mapillary will run some post-processing on your imagery. And they'll do things like preserve privacy, they'll blur faces and sometimes signs. But the really cool thing that they do is they will predict features from those images. So they'll do some analysis and say, okay, we see that there are three pictures here driving past this intersection. There's a utility pole here, a street light here, a fire hydrant here, and what looks like some bike parking over here. And so they will actually make points on the map that are, we're hoping pretty soon to be able to just add to the rapid editor to add as, a, as an editing experience where you can say, okay, I used to be able to just see these points overlaid on the map in rapid, but now I can actually work with them and add them to the map and make things better. In the, in the same process again, this is the human in the loop sort of confirming, yes, bike parking is here. Yes, this is a sign kind of thing. Yep, that's exactly right. I think this is absolutely brilliant. But let's say I, uh, I am a, a council somewhere. I think it would be beneficial for me to have, or beneficial for the council, for the, the geographic area that I'm responsible for, to have their data in OSM. How do I do that? Obviously, I can get people to, to bike around with uh, these 360 cameras on their heads or whatever and take photos, upload them through Mapillary, that kind of thing. How would I, let, let's say I already have this data, I have my authoritative data sources. How do I get it into the, the ESRI community data sets? Another great question, and we tried to address this a little bit actually in a recent appearance that a couple of my colleagues made at State of the Map US. The idea overall is that, let's say you're the geospatial head of like a county seat somewhere in Illinois, and you've got all these great building shapes, you want to get them into OpenStreetMap. There's a few things you would need to do if you wanted to do this by yourself. You'd need to maybe hire some lawyers and figure out how to license the data appropriately. And then you would need to learn the OpenStreetMap data schema and then do some sort of manual conversion process on whatever format your data is in into a format that's ready to host an OSM. And then you'd have to know a little bit about software and how to maybe bring this data into whatever editor you want. So we can make you skip all those processes. And if you just, you can open a bug inside the Rapid Editor, there's a little magenta bug icon in the lower right, you can click on that. And then that will take you to a GitHub page where you can put in a, a data request. And we will right now take that request and work with you to get the data imported into Esri's API. It's a little bit of a manual process right now. And we are working on making that process a little bit better. We'd like it to make a little bit more 
turnkey so that you can just submit the data via a web portal and then someone will contact you after the fact. But for right now, it's a little bit more manual. So again, you're moving away from this map with AI and starting to talk about authoritative data sets and you're building these, these processes that people can that use. I mean, you just described to us how I, as, as a council, could upload my data or work with you to get it into the, the ESRI community data sets and then it would be visible in, in the rapid editor and people could start you know, conflating that data. And we've talked about roads and buildings and addresses. Can you see this working with like all of the kinds of data that a council or a municipality might have? Or is, is it going to be very limited in your, in your mind? I would say yes, with a small asterisk that depending on the shape of the data or the type of the data, we might have to spend some software engineering time trying to figure out how best to create an edit workflow that will handhold the user through adding this data. There's a lot of engineering time that goes into making an edit flow very easy to use and to only surface the data that the user needs to see to do the particular editing job they're interested in that day. Can you give me an example of that? What, 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 what would be an example of this the editing workflow? Sure. Right now, our building and road adding workflow is really, really good. We only show you buildings that don't already exist in the map, and we only show you road segments that don't exist in the map, which is to say, if a road is already mostly mapped in OpenStreetMap, but maybe it's missing a couple of side streets feeding into and out of it, and we've predicted those, then you will only see those two little road segments appear, and you'll be able to add those without having to worry about looking at a predicted road that is superimposed on top of an existing road and then trying to have to reason about them. So we did a lot of work to try and make sure that when you are using the meta roads layer, if you add the road, you don't then also have to connect it to all of the roads that it should be connected to. The editor just does that for you. It stitches everything appropriately together so you have a good road network. Is there also some sort of workflow or a possibility of looking at several different background maps as an example? or? satellite imagery layers to see things over time you know like i'm thinking about roads that are in the summer obscured because of trees just as an example or waterways that you can't see in the summer but as soon as the leaves are gone you can see that okay there's a waterway there yes in fact we do actually have a couple of keyboard shortcuts in rapid for quickly swapping back and forth between different imagery layers so you can actually set favorite imagery layers within our imagery settings so you might decide that hey, in this particular area of the map, I really like what Bing and what Maxar have to offer. And it looks like Bing has great imagery, you know, taken in the spring with sort of like full leaf coverage. And Maxar happens to have data where most of the leaves are off the trees. And so then you can set those two up as your favorites. And then just by hitting two shortcuts on your keyboard, you can sort of seamlessly switch back and forth between those two imageries as you pan around and do your mapping. Wow, it's a brilliant idea. So Meta re- released something called Segment Anything. You know, when people aren't using these authoritative layers, when, when they're drawing by hand, it, like, is there a world where you could add Segment Anything to that? You know, click on this thing or just you know, segment the, the entire scene and then people could, could use those polygons to, to create features? Ah, yes. So now we're moving from the realm of AI to generate data and, and just directly using AI within the tools themselves, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So I love this idea. And we did, as soon as uh, Segment Anything was released, we sat down and tried to figure out if we could just immediately add this to Rapid and ship something with it. And the answer was not quite. And the reason being is most of what we do as OpenStreetMap editors is we're reasoning about orthographic satellite imagery. And due to a number of different factors, you know, the season in which the image was snapped whether the sun is casting oblique shadows on things. Maybe a roof doesn't all look like one monochromatic roof. It might have facets. Certain portions of it might be much darker than others. And so segment anything would work really well in some cases, but it would not work very well in others. And you'd have to click several times on a single roof shape just to be able to get something approaching what would be a a complete roof. So I think that if we were to use segment anything, for example, in a different context, it might be more appropriate for street view imagery segmenting, where if you're looking at a street view scene, 
clicking on a speed limit sign would be, I think, much easier for it to determine given the background imagery of the, the rest of the busy scene that it's that it's showing. Or maybe it would be really good at you know picking out a stop sign. That's an area of future work, though. Um, it's definitely something we're interested in experimenting further on. Maybe you could give, give us some idea of how many edits are, are made through the rapid editor, like a day, a week, whatever time frame seems reasonable to you. And, and perhaps if you, could, if you see any sort of patterns within these edits, are people focusing on certain geographic areas or... Yeah, it'd be interesting to hear some, some stats if you have any. Sure. So broadly speaking, stats-wise, we have, I would say, about a few hundred monthly active users. And in the four years that the program, that the Rapid has been available, we have seen, I think it's in the tens of millions of kilometers of roads have been added through our AI layers. And as far as buildings are concerned, we're also in the tens of millions there as well. So as far as the geo distribution of where these edits get done, I would say the preponderance of them is in North America as of late. But back when we first released Rapid back in 2019, we actually had some organized mapping in some of the Southeast Asian countries such as Thailand, the Philippines, and Vietnam, where we actually had an internal QA team go through and use these road predictions to sort of complete the road networks in those countries. So all in all, we've driven quite a bit of change into OpenStreetMap, and we think that we've had a really positive impact on the completeness of the data in the project overall. It sounds like that's a lot of, you know, of data that's been added. And there's hundreds of millions more bits of data, either address points or buildings or road segments waiting uh, still to be added to the map. So there's, there's plenty more to do. Even if we stopped adding new data to Rapid, I think the community would have its work cut out for it just to contend with the data that we already have available right now. Maybe you could talk a little bit about the work of the humanitarian OpenStreetMap team and the, the tasking that they do with regards to disaster response. I'm pretty sure that they use Rapid for that as well. Yes, that's right. So the humanitarian OpenStreetMap team has a software bundle they call Tasking Manager. And you can imagine if you have a whole bunch of editors who want to, say, help out after an earthquake or other natural disaster, uh, it's not sufficient to just send all of these well-meaning mappers to a specific country and tell them to just go edit. Um, you need to impose a little bit more structure on those edits. And a big way that Tasking Manager does that is by subdividing the area being mapped into smaller section. So it will slice and dice a country into a few hundred vaguely square-shaped areas for people to then go and map individually. So it's a way of sort of dividing and conquering the map problem. And back in February of 2023, we saw our daily active users for Rapid skyrocket to something like 20 or 30x wow. of our normal daily active users. Um, and we realized this was because we had successfully worked with Hot to get Rapid to be one of the editors uh, that they publish with their software. And so project managers working on the Turkey earthquake response were able to use Rapid pretty effectively to look at that country in the wake of that natural disaster. Just out of curiosity, the, the tasking, like the dividing the, the country, and maybe in this case, the, the region that was affected by the earthquake in, in Turkey, dividing that into sections, what, what does that mean for, for the mappers? If I... Can many people work on the same section? If I say, yes, I'm working on this section, click on the, the square on my screen. Do I own that section? Can somebody else help me? How does all that work? Yes, generally speaking, it's just one person per segment. And you can click on that segment and that, that's now yours to edit. And so once you've finished your edits, you can signal to the tasking manager software, yes, I'm all done. But you can also check a box that says, I would like somebody to review my edits. So there may be a second pass of editing where maybe some folks with a little bit more experience with OpenStreetMap or perhaps with more experience with the local area being mapped for them to go over the work that the volunteers have done and verify that they've done a good job. Does that completely eliminate the problem of multiple users editing the, the same uh, feature at the same time? It doesn't completely eliminate it, but I would say it probably drives out 99% of the potential conflicts with doing this sort of editing. Occasionally, there will be some literal boundary type problems where a road 
will move from one tile over and bleed into the next one. And so that can lead to a few problems. But generally speaking, the tasking manager is really effective at kind of cutting down that sort of, that sort of noisy neighbor problem. So obviously in, in this circumstance, I would hope that people showed up and did their best work, you know, did the, the best they could and were honestly trying to help. But my guess is at other times, you know, people show up with the intention to vandalize the map, to add things or, or just to click around and, and not do great work. Do you build anything into the rapid editor to help find this, identify it, or, or maybe completely stop it from happening? Sure. So our first line of defense in OpenStreetMap is probably OpenStreetMap's biggest feature, which is the OSM community. Individual users who are found to be making either irresponsible, ill-advised, or sometimes just straight up malicious edits, they will be caught by the community and they can be sort of policed very effectively that way. And that generally is only for the, the really sort of egregious, problematic users. That said, Rapid does have a built-in limiting factor where once you have added 50 AI or authoritative bits of data to the map, then you are asked to commit what you have done. This sort of cuts down on enormous change sets where people are just clicking as fast as they can, adding 10,000 buildings to the map without thinking about it, and then continuing on their merry way. So we try to sort of build in a little bit of a speed governor there. And there are other ways that we have thought in the past of maybe how we can annotate change sets so that these are easier to find. So right now, anytime a data set is added to the map, we do tag the change set with a marker saying, hey, this mapper used this particular Esri data set to make these edits. So if you have a problem with the data being added here, it's either a problem with the underlying data set, in which case you can talk to Esri about it and flag that as, a, as an issue, or you can take it up with the user in question who may be doing bad things with the data. So there are ways to track wherever Rapid is making changes with these data sets. Is there anything about the time that it took to make the edits? You know, you mentioned like 10,000, not that this is possible, but if someone makes their, I don't know, 50 edits in half a minute, would that raise any flags? I would say that probably would raise some flags, but up until now, one of our design tenets in Rapid is to, to really be very careful about putting in policy type decisions and how we want to sort of, we don't want to be policing our users every move. And we feel like it, it might be a difficult thing to start adding these sorts of mechanics to editing, you know, putting a user in timeout for adding things too fast, because perhaps they're using a very high quality data set that really does not need any significant human in the loop approval to contend with, in which case we've just frustrated, potentially frustrated a user who's doing good work. And if it turns out they're doing bad edits, we're hopeful that the community can catch them at it. So you've got this huge sort of technical challenge. You're building the, this product that is designed to speed up the process, uh, this conflation process, adding authoritative data into OpenStreetMap. And my guess is it's for, for all users, for our very experienced users, as users to complete beginners. So it's a technical challenge in itself. It's a design challenge. But you've also got this community challenge, like a cultural challenge. Who are we building this for? The community was around long before Rapid showed up, and, and they're the ones creating the map as a community-driven map. Out of those two challenges, is there any one, you know, which is the hardest for you? Is it the technical side or, or the, the cultural side? That's a, an extremely good question. Um, and so the, the community is never far from our thoughts when we're thinking up either new data sets or new editing capabilities that we want to put in. And so we're constantly weighing the impactfulness of the work that we do. We're thinking about, okay, if we implement feature X, how does this make or improve the mapping experience for enough people? And that's actually one of the guiding principles that led us to creating Rapid V2. Rapid version two was fundamentally rewritten from the ground up to be fast. And the reason we did that was because it was a problem affecting 100% of our users. So everybody who was opening Rapid V1, they were having a lot of trouble looking at even sort of you know, medium 
uh, complexity scenes, you know, small cities that were really well mapped were causing the editor to slow to a crawl. Your laptop would start to get really hot. The fans would be spinning up and you'd be looking at maybe one or two frames per second while you're panning around. And it was a pretty easy choice for us to say, okay, this is a problem that is only going to get worse as the map data gets better and more and more full featured. As people add things, it's only going to get worse from here. And also at the back of our minds, we had a bunch of cool features that we wanted to sort of add to the editing experience. And we knew that we just would not be able to add them on top of this sort of old renderer that was already really, really slow. So we spent pretty much the entirety of 2022 rewriting things from the ground up to make Rapid much, much faster. And that landed about a month ago. And since then, we've been sort of looking at tackling the next order of problems, trying to figure out how we can empower editors as best we can. So you, you talked about that um, being in touch with the community, what, what do they want? What, what do they need? What would be helpful for them? I completely understand that. And I, I appreciate why that approach is so important. But isn't there a tension there? Because are they just going to ask for faster horses when you could give them a car? Do you ever find yourself having to balance like what they want and what, what they actually need or what is possible? Yes, for sure. Uh, and part of that is just straight engineering time. The developer team for Rapid is just two folks. It's myself and my colleague, Brian Housel, who folks who know OpenStreetMap know that he's been a fixture in the community for years. And he did a lot of great work on ID before moving over to work with us. And we simply do not have enough hours in the day to accommodate every feature request or every data request. And that hurts, but I think that's just the reality of, of most people's work life. So you, you don't have time to tackle absolutely everything that gets thrown at you. And very often we'll get people that submit bugs or feature requests, and we simply have to say, yes, this is a great idea, but either it's not impactful enough for our total user base that we don't want to go after it, or this is too technically difficult for us to tackle, yes, it would be a really good feature to have, but it would simply take too much development time to bring to fruition. And it never feels good to have to make those sorts of judgment calls, but that's just software engineering. Yeah, no, again, it makes a lot of sense. So with that in mind, um, my, my guess is you have a design roadmap for, for this uh, product for, for Rapid. Could you give us a peek into the, what the future of Rapid uh, might look like? Sure. Well, there'll be a post going up as a, a GitHub discussion in the, the Rapid repo later this week about this very topic. But I can say for right now, since we just landed Rapid V2, we've got this much faster renderer, but it pretty much has the same feature set as Rapid V1. We're looking now that we have this great renderer of ways that we can support not adding data to the map. Um, that's something that we think we've got some pretty good answers for with our existing functionality. And if you imagine, for your listeners at home to think about it's really easy when you look at a map tile to tell whether it's well mapped or not. It's much harder to look at a tile's worth of data and say, well, is this map tile up to date? When was the last time this information was looked at, edited? Is it really missing any data or do I need to modify all of the building footprints? And so what we're trying to think about for the future is editing workflows that sort of promote the process of map gardening. And by map gardening, I mean taking the data that is already existent in the map, recognizing that perhaps this populated city is already extremely well mapped, but maybe you know a shop has closed since the last time somebody looked at it. Maybe there are a bunch of sidewalks added to this road, and we need to call those bits of change out. And those are much harder things to do in a map editor in a way that is easily understandable for new users. And so we have our work cut out for us trying to figure out how we can surface these new gardening use cases and to present them in a way that is easily understandable by brand new mappers. For example, somebody sitting down to work on a humanitarian open street map tasking manager task. They should be able to sit down and use Rapid and not have to think too hard about how to use the data we present to them. Yeah, I can see how that is not going to be an easy problem to solve, especially the, the design side of it. In terms of figuring out which elements of the map, like which features you want people to look at, what, what are some of your ideas around that? Is it going to be, 
okay, I can't see this feature anymore in these these other authoritative data sets. Is it it hasn't been updated since you know in fifteen years? That kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Could could you give us uh, some insight there? Right. You're going to have to possibly cut me off here because I could ramble on this topic for probably an hour or two about prospective features we'd like to put in. But one thing I want to do in general is give people more say in how they see what's being rendered on the map. I would love it for somebody who is, say, really into bike infrastructure to be able to pop open a little you know, preferences dialogue and say, hey, Rapid, stop showing me everything rendered this way. I just want you to show me things like bike parking, bike lanes. I want you to maybe style any bike parking this way, style a bike lane that is separated from the main road by bollards this way, draw bike lanes that aren't separated by any actual like you know barriers this way, and to, to give people more of a way to customize what they see. Because in the end, there's tons of data inside this scene, and there are infinite ways to represent it to the user. And I'd like to give people more tools to figure out how they want to represent the data that they need to do their job. And as a developer, I can never anticipate every possible use case, but I can perhaps develop some tooling that will let people support their own use cases. So, so that sounds awesome. The idea that you can personalize it based on the, the things that you're interested in. But is the idea there also, okay, if you personalize it, it'll be easier for the user to recognize this data and therefore easier to see where potential mistakes are or features that need to be updated. Is that the thinking behind that? Yes, that's exactly right. We want to sort of flip the script and no longer be in the business of creating bespoke edit workflows for every possible use case and to just give people a generalized tool set that they can then customize and use to their own purposes. I like this idea of map gardening. It makes me think of people having your ownership over a certain tile, you know, <laughs> where they, this is my tile. It's, I am the gardener here. I am responsible for it. I am going to so, you know, make sure that it's, that it's updated and that, that it's correct. I think that, that's, that's really interesting. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. And I think that it's sort of maybe a bit counterintuitive for folks who like, like to create things, for folks who like to, if you think of yourself as a map, editor. I think map editing in OpenStreetMap up until now has been, all right, how many changes can I drive into the map? How many empty spaces can I fill in with good road or building data? And I think over time, we'll run out of those places and we need better tooling to reason about the data that already exists. Yeah, that, that is really interesting because it's that um, instant gratification. There was nothing, now there's something. Right. Uh, and, and I guess like if you're, if you're an editor and you're doing this work, your status goes up. You, the more edits you make, the, you know, people can see that. Oh, this person has done a lot of edits. They are really involved in the community. But the, I guess the hard work is that the maintaining of it, perhaps. I, I wonder how you build like, status around that. I wonder how you build in that, that, that gratification of, I, I updated something. Because in some cases, I guess nothing will change. Maybe, maybe that house just got an extra corner on it or, or something like that. Yes, I am certainly... In agreement with you, it's much more satisfying right now to start with sort of a blank canvas of just sat imagery and then add all of the shapes to the scene and say, oh, look at all this, look at all this data I just created. It's for most folks, myself included, perhaps a little less satisfying to just go through and maybe add some metadata to those shapes. One of the ways that we can combat this, though, is to give people better visualizations of the data, the metadata tags, for example, in OpenStreetMap that they may be adding. And we're hoping to release a, a new update of Rapid, uh, Rapid 2.1, with one such visualization, and that is for building heights. So right now, Rapid is a 2D editor. You click on a building, you see its building footprint, and then you might see some tagging information that conveys the height of the building, either in meters or in levels. Uh, you can think of it as like how many stories tall this building is. And it's much more compelling if you have a 3D viewer and you can look at the 3D scene as you're sort of adding the building height data than it is to just do it with a 2D viewer. And so we're hoping to find more use cases like that, where we can kind of bring that like, hey, I'm, I'm creating you know, new data. I'm adding things to the scene that weren't possible just in 2D or with the way we render things right now. So soon, 
hopefully at the beginning of July, coming up in the next couple of weeks, we'll have a refresher version of Rapid, and you can start adding building height to your neighborhood and seeing those changes happen live in your editor. That is really interesting. I was just assuming that, you know, especially seeing as how we've been talking about authoritative data, that any metadata, any attributes that were attached to that would, if it made sense, just come over with that. So confirming the polygon is, yes, this is correct. In the rapid editor would also import, you know, the, the attributes that made sense for the OSM schema. That is true, actually. So there are some of the building shapes that we get from Esri, for example, they come pre-filled with address data and all of that tagging is done for you. So that's quite a bit of a time saver, but not every data set has accurate building heights. Sometimes, you know, if this is surveyors that have like generated this just from like a, a, a building surveying perspective, maybe the building height isn't part of the data that gets added there. And also there's whole entire countries worth of data where the building heights, you know, don't exist for any data set that we know of, and we leave that as an exercise to the individual editors in those local areas to do. Well, Ben, we have come a long way in the conversation. Uh, I guess to, to, to round this off, is there anything that you wish people understood about the rapid editor? Like, you get questions about it, we're like, ah, if I could tell everybody the answer to this one question, but what, what would that question be? Or what would you tell them? Sure. From our appearances at conventions like phosphor G, state of the map, uh, the question we get most often is like, why didn't I hear about this? Uh, I, I'm like, how long has Rapid existed? And so my, my answer to that basic question is like, we hope that everybody uses Rapid as their sort of day-to-day -day open street map editor. We exist, we are here, we are extremely willing to entertain your suggestions for features. And if you're interested in helping us co-develop, we're also interested in working with other folks. We're on GitHub. It's open source. You can come help us out. So yeah, I, I would say that the question I would hope that people ask is, why should I use this? And the short answer is, A, it's much faster than it used to be, kind of frankly a joy to use because of that. And B, we have tons of data for you to use in your editing workflows to save you time. That's really interesting. That I, I got to say, my assumption here was that would be the question that people would ask most frequently. But it sounds like you've got a marketing problem on your hands. It sounds like if people are asking, like, how long has this been around? Why well, didn't I know about this before? That sounds like a marketing issue. For sure. Uh, and we've kind of recognized that. But we're getting a lot of great support from our team. And we're trying to just sort of get the word out so that people understand that uh, we're an option. Well, Ben, thank you very much. This has been a really enlightening conversation. I appreciate your time sort of slowly but surely walking us through this. I realize I probably asked a lot of naive questions, but you did a fantastic job of explaining it to even to someone like me. So thank you very much. We've said it a few times during this episode, but just so it's clear to people, where can they go if they want to try this out? What What is the URL? What do they need to search for? Sure. If you search for Rapid Editor, you should find us. You can find us at rapideditor.org. Once you go there, you will see a button in the upper right that says Start Mapping, and that will take you directly to our editor. It runs right in your browser. No need to install anything. If people have questions, can they reach out to you or the team? Can they like post questions on GitHub? Or is there a community somewhere they can, they can ask for help? Yes. So you can come to the OpenStreetMap US Slack instance. We have a rapid channel in there that both myself and Brian are in constantly. And if you use rapid, you can click on the bug icon in the lower right. It's a little magenta bug, and that will send issues and feature requests directly to our GitHub account. And so once you've created your first issue there, you can expect us to get in touch with you within a day or two about your request. Well, Ben, again, this has been awesome. Thank you very much. I uh, really appreciate your work. And, and thank Brian for me too, please. He, he couldn't be here today, but it sounds like he's been one of the driving forces behind this for some time. So please just say thanks from myself and from the community. Will do. And thank you very much for having us on. It's been a pleasure. I really hope you enjoyed that episode with Ben Clark, one of the software developers on the Rapid Editor. And probably what you don't realize about this episode is how long we have been working on this. So approaching a company like Meta is not nearly as easy as it might seem. There's no email address to write to. You have to know someone who knows someone who knows someone. And even that's not the biggest problem. The biggest problem is actually getting permission. 
So this happens whenever I work with anyone from one of these larger tech companies. Inevitably, there's a communications department involved and they have to vet you. Is it okay if one of our employees appears on this podcast? And that vetting process can take forever. For example, I've been really interested in talking about some of the amazing stuff that that Meta is, is producing for the last two years. And this is the first time that it's actually worked out. And this is not a critique of the process or of Meta as a company at all. I just think it's an interesting little piece of of context that that I thought you might enjoy. Speaking of context, uh, we mentioned a company or a project called Mapillary. Uh, I actually was lucky enough to record an episode with the the founder or one of the founders of, of this company before it was acquired by Meta quite some time ago. I'll put a link to that in the show notes. Um, it's actually quite a it's a really interesting episode and goes into a lot more depth of, of what they're doing and, and how they're doing it. There'll be links to the humanitarian open street map team. I think you know if you follow those links, you can have a, a better understanding of how that tasking tool works that we that we talked about. And also, if you haven't heard about this segment anything tool that, that Meta has developed, it is well worth checking that out. It's Some people have been doing some really, really interesting stuff with it. I've seen it integrated in, into a few enterprise products already so i'll put a link to that in the show notes as well also if you just search for segment anything meta something like that it, it'll show up as well well as always thank you very much for tuning in all the way to the end it's much appreciated if you want to reach out to me for whatever reason the best place to do that is at mapscaping.com we also have a, a job board there if you're lo- if you're looking for for your next geospatial challenge that would be a good place to to start Okay, that's it for me. That's it for this week's episode. I'll be back again soon. I hope that you'll take the time to join me then. Bye.